Good evening and welcome to Plain Talk. My name is Christopher Graham. Thank you for joining me. As you know, on November 12th, we have local government elections across the country. This, these will be the last elections before the 2020 national and regional elections. Concerns have been expressed about the lack of enthusiasm, the constant controversy over GCOM, the appointment of its chairman, the court case, the city council prominently. Can these matters be fixed? It's a tough sell. Tonight, as I've done for the two other major political groups, the AFC and the, the APNU, tonight I have the representatives from the PPP Civic. Among them, or the persons are Ms. Gail Teixeira, who is a prominent national politician, <coughs> sitting immediately, well, Gail is at the other side of the table. S sitting next to her is Ms. Amelia Ali, a UG student um, and a sitting councillor over the West Demer. We have Mr. Ron Amos, a businessman, all boys town, Charles town. And we have Mr. Bishram Kopen, Kupen, PPPC constituency candidate, border Stabrook Lacey town, and therefore part of the much maligned <coughs> city council. <coughs> Friends, welcome to Plato. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having us. Let me ask you this, and I hope you, you're going to whip this up. <coughs> Why the apathy over local government elections? Well, I'll ask them because they've been in the field. I've, I'm working in Bartica, so I'll answer for that end. But I haven't been seeing that kind of apathy. What I'm seeing is a different thing, that a lot of the people we approach house to house, talking to, that a number of people voted for APNU AFC, and they feel betrayed. <coughs> They feel conflicted as to what to do. And many are saying they're not going to vote at all. But in other areas, we've been welcomed by people who would have 2015, 2016 voted for APNU AFC. So we're not exactly seeing apathy. I think in, in my analysis in the areas where I work, I'm seeing people um, that are conflicted. They feel betrayed, and they're not sure which way to put their head. And we're saying in the PVPC, we're the family to come to, and that it is the People's Progressive Party whose track record shows what we've done in government. And so that's my experience. You're right about it in another end, so if you look at the other way, if you look at the turnout in the 2016 elections, in some areas it was 49%, mm -hmm. in APNU areas, APNU mm -hmm. AFC areas, 51% didn't go out to vote at all. And so, Having won in 2015, you would have thought there would have been that, you know, keep, keep your government yes. going kind of thing. There wasn't that. There was a down. Uh, whereas in the PPP areas, the areas that PPP won, you saw the opposite happening. People went out more aggressively to vote. So this election, I think, is going to be very, very interesting to see what plays out. The combination of the PPP voters coming out and showing their strength and... Um, whether the APNU AFC will be able to mobilize their support. Ms. Halley, I, I wonder if you could tell us your experience. Bearing in mind, uh, I, I take what you say, but um, Sabotuse did a uh, people yeah. uh, that, that survey that they normally do. Yes, uh, and they said the everybody, yeah, the man in the street. People said that don't, some of them, they're not yeah. interested, yeah, some yeah. of them are not noticed. Mm -hmm. what, what's your experience 
Ms. Ali? Um, well, I've been doing a lot of house-to-house -house work thing, and I think I think my experiences mirror somewhat like Comrade Gale's. Um, people are, aren't so motivated to go out and vote for local government elections. They are a bit conflicted. And, um, but I think it is up to us to help motivate them. I mean, you have to let these people know that, you know, at the end of the day, these decisions and voting for local government election will in turn be benefit, a uh, benefit of them because we are making the decisions for them. It will affect them, it will affect their communities. And, you know, they are a bit discouraged, but we need to encourage them to, you know, go out and vote and stuff. Mr. Kupen? Well, I have been doing a lot of um, house to house work also. and. Um, this is what, in Georgetown. In Georgetown, in Constituency <coughs> 7, which is the main business district. Um, uh, that uh, North Road um, is the border, North Road to the north, um, Hatfield Street to the south, Blessington Road on the east, and Demora River uh, to the west. Um, I found a lot of people there disappointed. They had a lot of expectations for the council, uh, especially in some of the main areas like drainage, etc. When it came to the point of voting, uh, there were some, but I think the majority wants to come out there and vote. They basically are saying they need to get the folks out from City Hall. Now, whether that will translate in the vote for the PPP or whatever, I'm not sure. But uh, they're very motivated. They want to vote. Um, they've been reading a lot about the corruption, and especially now that the COI is going on, uh, they're, they're very anxious about um, like genuine action coming there to reform the City Hall. Um, a lot of the things I've been writing about and I have spoken about in the council, those very things are coming up with the COI. So in some ways, the councillors, myself and the other PPP councillors have been raising at, ex at city council, are now being raised at the, um, the COI. So in some ways, we feel vindicated. But in terms of the attitude, a lot of people are disgusted with what's going on there. They want to see city hall function. They want to see the drains clean, the basic core services performed. So while in some areas they may, um, people may say that they don't want to vote uh, when I went around, there are people who have expressed, the majority of them, that they want to see change, and I, by that I take it to mean that they will go out and vote on election day. Mr. Evers, I, I, I give me your perspective, and, and, and tell me at the same time if you think the city council has been a good advertisement for local government. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Mr. Ram. Um, I have a, a different dynamic in which I'm dealing with in the Charleston, Arbyston area, or the Arbyston, Charleston area, where the people of that community generally are not edified as to what are the basic mandate of the, the council, mm -hmm. or the councillors who was there before, and what they're entitled to as a community. So the general perspective of visiting the, the residents in the community was a general strategy on behalf of our party. So we have, we have initially had planned that, that that's our move. And from visiting these different households and different families of different race and different ethnic backgrounds and so forth, what we, find out, what, what we found out in our, in, in our constituency is that, like I said before, they, they do not know what they were entitled to. Apart from that, we had to go over the whole process of the importance of local government and then let them know or see what they should be entitled to and then empower them on the basis that this is, what, this is how it's supposed to be done. This is what you're entitled to. This is as a citizen paying taxes to the local government community, to the, local, to the city hall, this is, what you're, this is what you've been disfranchised of. Um, no, no from the, from, for the second question, no from the perspective of the City Hall has not been a good vehicle in terms of advertising um, local, government. local government elections. Because the dynamic from the outside, because I'm a new councillor, I'm new to this, but from the outset, right, um, I think what they, what they, what they advocate is um, a dependency a dependency on central government to bail them out of everything. That's one. And two, the little fund that they have to disburse in a positive way, whether it's through infrastructure, health, whatever sector, to get it done for the people of those communities. 
um, they fail miserably in those regards. You've raised an interesting point, this dependency. Now, in Georgetown, the, the heart of the business um, life of Ghana, it's probably easier to raise some revenue. Does our local government system really allow for any kind of autonomy given the kind of control a central government minister has over the, the politics and, and key appointments and how much control the Minister of Finance has in terms of the money that, that is available well, to, to bo local government bodies across the, the country. But well, I mean legislatively yeah. though, they, they, let's go to the, the new legislation that came out 20, uh, 2010 to 2014. The minister's role was amended in yes. many ways. And so the theory after in the constitutional reform process was to have a, a vibrant local government yes. system. That was the theory to have a greater devolution of power, etc., and decentralization. And so the Fiscal Transfer Act was designed to be able to have competition. Not a hell of a lot of money being transferred. No, 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 mm. no. But I think what the government has done now, which is they're diluting it in a sense that if you cre create, although, as you know, in the 1980, the system that set up the, the original demarcation of the yes. local authorities um, and NDCs had 100 but yeah. only seven, you know, six or three, I think, were designated and de and de and demarked in the 1980s, 90s, 80s, and only then it became 71 uh, later on, and now 80. But when we start taking tiny areas with tiny populations and making them NDCs, you really are creating a situation impossible. They're not feasible. Back to the dependency thing. Absolutely. So Georgetown is an example of a dependency thing from a, a very perverted way. And what the government is exacerbating the situation by creating now nine new areas. When you have places along the Palm Room River, three new NDCs, three councillors, th three seats that you will now have uh, three councillors for PR, three for constituencies. You take Arnaputa, you take... Um, these different areas uh, that, and yet you don't make places like Diamond a town, mm -hmm. or Tushan a town, mm -hmm. or Parika a town. Why not those areas? They have all the, it, the requirements of being towns, but you take now these three little areas on the Pomoon River. How are they going to tax? How are they going to have rates and taxes? Yes. How will they be able to sustain themselves? So the, the theory of the system, I think, still has validity but it has become perverted, and I may not be using the right word, in that in the, and, and the government seems to have this very, very strange notion of, and I listened to the president talk about devolution, mm -hmm. decentralization, but people have to have the means to do what they have to do. So the law uh, tried to create a situation where the minister's powers were reduced, but still, and, and, but still, the, the government would take on the large infrastructure works in communities. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that, th I believe in the whole task force and all the belief was that over time, many of these local authorities would have capacity to then do larger works. But the way it is now with 80 of them, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Ms. Ali, you, you, you've, you've been operating within... Yes, I have. How, how has that worked financially? Um, you see, the thing well, is... tell them which NDC you're in, too. That would be good. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. I'm from the... Shortville, Cornelia, Ida. Ida, NDC, yeah. And um, when you talk about dependency and, you know, the local government and the minister's involvement in your local NDC, um, to a certain extent, they don't, he doesn't have much involvement, but there are different ways and mechanisms in which they can use to control what's happening in the exactly. NDC. For instance, our subvention, and this is not. This has not only happened within my NDC, but various NDCs throughout my region. And the thing is, is that they're stymieing releasing the money and stuff to us. So yeah. at, we may get the money till at the end of the year, whilst we could have been doing projects throughout the year. So this is one of the way in which they can, you know, yeah. directly affect and control things in a way at our. How NDC. much latitude do you have for raising any money? Um. 
Well, apart from taxes and stuff like that, um, I think... That's very lo basic and local yeah, rates. And that's very basic as well. So apart from taxes and the minor things that we have bringing in revenue, um, apart from that, we um, we don't really have that much, you know, yeah. with bringing in income to our NDC. Which is what drives everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly, which is what drives everything. City Council, of the, in the news, they get subvention, they spend, get subvention, spend. Going Can't pay for the garbage disposal. Yeah, they don't it, seems it. A, it seems a recurring theme. Yeah. The, the subvention that they receive, 24 million annually, um, is insufficient. Million? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's insufficient for the amount of work that needs to be done. But the problem there is to quantify uh, what exactly they're spending because the, there's no accountability, there's no transparency, no true figures coming forward. Even the Auditor General has problems when he's, um, for all the audits he's tried to, to do there, problems coming up with the true figures. Uh, but the fact must be remembered that Georgetown is the capital city of this country. So I think the central government needs to play a bigger part in terms of the expenditure that the council has and infrastructure maintenance. A lot of money is like, for instance, the city constabulary um, charges people for various violations and those are taken to court 10, but none of that money comes back to the council. Uh, the city council also is So you do the prosecution. Mm -hmm. You go to court, mm -hmm. your, 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 your and staff the fine, there, mm -hmm. and the fines go to central to government. central government. It doesn't come back to the council. Um, the other area also is the... the areas for amendments, boy. For solid waste, because... Um, you know, most of the government offices are located in the city, and so I think the entire, we need to have like an entire review of the way the city council operates, where its revenue is coming from, etc. Well, I hope you see the, the Commission of Inquiry yes. as, mm -hmm. as an opportunity for doing that. Yeah, we, we see that, we welcome it, and as uh, Commander Gale had mentioned, we intend to go there to um, give testimony um, on Mr. the situation. Yeah. Mr. what's your experience in terms of how they, um, how how autonomous, how free they, these various bodies are to to manage their affairs? Because that's that's what our constitution really that underpins our constitution. Right, and um, well, how autonomous they be is is as a result of what is the end product, which mm -hmm. is now, mm -hmm. right? And the end product is definitely shows us that. There's, there's lots of room for expansion. There's lots of room to delete, add, subtract, and, wh and whatever it is. But getting back to the main point, um, I think the local government elections this time and how, how the PPP is attacking it from the angle of um, our totality and we con we contesting in all different, in, in all 15 constituencies and and um, the areas, um, I think it will bring it. This this will bring about a balance of power. It will bring about a balance of power, and like in, for instance, an area like where I come from, the Arbyston Charleston area, will definitely benefit from 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 these situations. But let me ask you all this: Do you really believe it is proper for the national parties, the two juggernauts, mm. to be dominating local government elections as, as they are? How do you justify that? I don't know if you want to answer that from here. <laughs> I, I think that clearly the, the first round of 2016, you had more NGOs, you had more yeah. smaller groups. And unfortunately, I think uh, these elections is about 2020. These elections of 2016, 2018, sorry, are not only about local government elections, it's about the 2020. And so I think in this process, the non-governmental organizations have been overwhelmed, or in some case, just decide they're not going out there. They may be backing whichever political party their members support. And I think that it's unfortunate because I think the whole idea of the hybrid system was to encourage greater participation of citizens. Political, so there's room for the political parties as they are in all local governments. But systems. do you think the, the, the political parties or the big political parties are too dominant for, 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 for democracy, well, for well, local government? No, we've got to be careful with that, Ram, because the, the, 
the right of the citizens to choose. Yes, I know. And the right to vote. And so we can't say at this time that right now in Ghana there's... Basically, you're talking about three parties. It's two parties. Let's put the third one aside. Mm. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I mean, seriously. You don't want to name yeah. the third one. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, everybody knows who I'm talking about. But basically, fundamentally, the, the two political parties are the two giants in the room in terms of the future of Guyana. But do, the they, know, do, they, do they know, do they understand the local conditions, local yeah, government? I appreciate that. I mean, I can't answer for any other party but our own, and that is that in these elections, having had the experience of 2016, that we have gone into really trying to involve people. The, we've all been talking about hand billing, going out there, reaching people, talking to people. In fact, I don't know if the public knows uh, um, that how do we select candidates? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, it was some people thought it was a risk we were taking as a political party. We went uh, on, and that, this is across the board. Mm -hmm. There are specific nuances in different communities, but. We went and had consultations in various communities. Who did they think they wanted to support? Who would they support? Um, <clears throat> in some cases, in areas where we couldn't hold community meetings because it may be not an area that supports the PVP, we had consultations with people in the area quietly. And we came up with lists of names of people. So there was an attempt to, to democratize, to reach outside the PVP and go into the communities and find more people. So that on a number of list of the 3,000 candidates, you have people who are not members of the People's Press. I was, I was going to ask you yes. that. You're not, yeah. and in fact, so you our, have and our, decision, mm -hmm. our decision as a party leader was that 50-50, 50% in the totality of it must be able to show that we have a 50% civic component that is not uh, members of the PVP, supporters, obviously, we're not going to include someone who hates us to death, yes. but that um, we're not we're not masochistic in that way. But <laughs> we would, and so for us was, and we we found it very. The actual process of getting candidates: how do we find Amos? How do you find these different people across the country? Let them, Arnaputa, you know, Mabaruma, Bartika, Linden, Georgetown wherever we went, including the, the NDCs. And then the, the list came up, and each grouping, each, uh, what do you call local government grouping, yeah, yeah, yeah. had to come before the executive and justify, and to say, and in some cases, uh, if they came with an all-male list, for example, they were sent back. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was an attempt to, one, diversify, one, to be great inclusive. I don't think any other political party has done that. What about what about gender, ethnicity, age demographic? Okay, mm -hmm. the, the I can talk from my the area I'm responsible for because I don't have all the stats for the whole country. But what is interesting uh, from a, a visual, if you look at the photographs of all the candidates, which we have been publishing in the Mirror newspaper, you will see a radical increase in women in each constituency, where before they may have been all male or one woman, you've seen an increase of younger people. In my area that I'm working, the women are the majority on the list. So I have 15 women who are candidates and 13 men. And so it's quite an interesting dynamics because some of the men are learning how to deal with women actually being more outspoken and stuff like that. Let me put this question to you, Ron. How comfortable are you? Your PPP is often seen as this Indian party. How comfortable are you Well, as an afro is? Just black. to backtrack a bit, right? Yeah, go on. I was a member of the People's Progressive Party since 2011. I was a member of the Good Fortune PPP group. Ah. So I just, came to, I just came back to town to do my work. I always lived at the Charleston. I have a business there. Sure. I reside there. I never move from there. I'm a product of that environment. Okay. Right? So this is... The everyday business, this is the everyday world. No, but I'm talking about being part of this, the PPPC. Very comfortable in my, in my skin and in my environment and field. The people, yes, here and there, you would get the, uh, the, the, out, the odd outburst of, you know, the racialism. You're black, you should be there and you should be here. 
But I know where my political... Let me see. Indians get that kind of criticism when they belong to another group as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's normal. That's, that's, no, that's normal in Guyana. But I think, you know, as someone, if you look at the photographs of the different candidates, I haven't really been privy to look at the stats for the APNU AFC in terms of their candidates. But I know from the PUP candidates that we are seeing of 3,000, we fielded every local authority, 80 local authorities, 27,000 backers. So that's a reflection yeah. that you've got 27,000 backers for 3,000 candidates across 80 local authorities. That this must be a reflection of some citizen involvement, citizen uh, participation. But if you look at the photographs of our candidates, you're seeing, uh, I believe, a greater diversity as a political party for ethnicity, gender, and age than any other political party right now. Ms. Ali, let me ask you. Um, there's been a lot of talk mm -hmm. about the question of GCOM, and we know, we know the machinations that played out for the selection, um, because that's what it was, mm -hmm. the, 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 um, of the chairman. How comfortable are you mm -hmm. as a candidate that GCOM is going to adequately and fairly manage this process and do it competently? Um, I, am not, I am not confident in GCOM. I am confident in my party. So, assure not But is GCOM running the elections? <laughs> I know it is, right? But um, personally for me, and I, I don't speak for myself, I speak for the people within the community that I've spoken to whilst going house to house as well, they're not very confident that GCOM will be fair in the election process. But um, I think we have, we have very strong commissioners, and I think at the same time we are fighting for, our party is fighting for the elections to be free, free and fair. Um, but can we assure, can we assure the, the citizens of this country that it will be free, free and fair? We cannot. I think all we can do is assure that we will try our best to make sure that it's free and fair. Um, so, and that's basically where we stand. I think, um, but what, what we need to do as a citizen is to come out and vote regardless in, in a number in which that, do we have to come out and vote? So we- Is GCOM doing enough to promote these elections? They no. are not, no. Definitely, no, definitely not. Definitely. The education not. program is no. disaster. Well, so Total can disaster. they deliver? Mm -hmm. No. We do more work than GCOM. It, yes, we are, because going yeah. house to house as well, yeah. you, you figured out that, a lot of people don't exactly know how to vote, and I think... Or where to vote. Or where to vote, and th the fact that they have to vote two times, they and don't know yet, that. And worse and yet, in the communities where they've reduced the seats yeah. and demarcated the areas. And when you look at the maps where they've done demarcation, it's absolutely bizarre. And in, in Region 3, mm -hmm. you've got some really unbelievable matching of constituencies where the geography has changed completely. Um, so that these are Gail, concerns. Um, I know you're much younger than I am, but you remember we used to use the word gerrymandering a lot. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. this is for, this is real gerrymandering of a of a scale that that I think other than maybe 1964, which when I was just a little girl, that that was probably when last we saw major gerrymandering. I I, I can't remember the area in Region Three, but I remember seeing a map that was hilarious. I think it's too flat. I'm not sure. But this is when did this is this, this uh, time, period yes, yeah, yes. when they've reduced the seats in the um, the number of seats in an existing local authority, and so first of all the people were consulted. GCOM went in afterwards and just said, okay, here is the new map. This is the new consist constituencies. Took say, and I can't describe it well graphically, but let's say there's a village and there are nine constituencies going in a row. That's how it was in my, and they took the last constituency and the first constituency and brought them into one. So they've merged these two constituencies. It's almost like a U in the middle of the, the map of the area. People, where are they going to vote? Where, are, no your education. where are your commissioners in all of this? They have been there, but this is, remember, the, this is the big fight. This is a legal case, as far as I know, to do with the, that Bibi Shadik has brought. Because in some cases, the secretariat itself Mr. Bulkan gazetted these areas, 
named the reduction and the new areas. GCOM secretary went and started demarcating, I believe with people from the communities, and the commissioners were never consulted on these issues, or maybe partially consulted. Let me, you wanted to, you wanted to come and no, just I just, I just wanted to add to, um, Amelia? Right, Amelia, what, because, well, this, this door-to-door -door visiting and, and trying to get a feel of our community, right, has really yielded success in many different ways, in, in tremendously overwhelmed. So when I refer to as we're probably doing more work than GCOM, is because you would have laid out, when you enter these community, my community, when you enter, and before you could even get into why they should actually vote for you as a candidate under the People's Progressive Party, you have to go through the purpose of local government elections. Yeah, and that's not our together. job. Yes, yeah. yeah. That's not our job. Let me ask you this. And this um, to what extent do you think national issues, corruption, which you know how, how it mm -hmm. hampered the BBB in, in, in themselves, mm -hmm. past government, corruption, management of the oil and gas sector, management of sugar, management of rice, now management of the Burbies Bridge. To what extent are national issues going to play into local government elections? Well, I, national issues, uh, we have to look at this from the perspective that we're one country. So these national issues will, in fact, filter down to local entities, the local authority areas. Um, as you see, uh, as these local authority areas uh, function, um, some of the practices at the national level do filter down to the local areas especially those that have been accustomed to operating in a certain manner. Um, and I'm referring to the, the government and those areas that they have uh, controlled. Um, so these issues, I believe that there are a lot of mistakes that were being made. Uh, if I can jump to the park immediate contract, you referenced the oil contract. It's almost like somebody handed the city council a park immediate contract. They didn't read it and they signed it in a production share and agreement. Based sounds on like the, we did that with oil as well. Yes, mm -hmm. and it yeah, sounds like we yeah. did that too. They gave you a, a document, they just signed it without actually looking at what it is or understanding what is profit oil and cost of oil, etc. So these will eventually affect local authority areas, all these national issues. Well, let me put this other question to you then, mm -hmm. and I don't want Gail to come in on this one. <laughs> then if that is the case, mm -hmm. what's the message, what's the theme that's being given to... Um, contestants with these councils. The the over is is there an overall theme, for example? Th th there is an overall theme. It's accountability. Mm -hmm. There's transparency. There's good ma management and uh, good governance of the area that you're responsible for. Citizens' participation. Some of these contracts, the one you referred to about the production sharing agreement, this is a national issue. This is should not just be decided by one single minister who probably is not. No, but how do you filter that into your your local constituency? You're trying to get them to say, look, vote for me. Mm -hmm. um, if we succeed, you're going to get better local services, mm -hmm. roads, drainage, lights. Mm -hmm. um, maybe health services and so on. How do you meld the two, talking about oil and corruption, mm -hmm. when, when people are concerned mm -hmm. about, look, our, our roads mm -hmm. are potholed, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. our bridges are collapsing. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, when at the national level, if, if these things are done in the manner that I just um, outlined, the transparency, accountability... Well, they, no, but they're not being done. No, but at some point, well, you at the local level have to set the example and you have to demand that from the national government. As, Let me uh, ask you, Mr. Ali, um, resident. how do you, what do you, what do you see as the theme coming out centrally? Mm -hmm. And how do you translate that in, in, when you go to your house to house work? I mean, apart from people are concerned, not just uh, f about their roads being uh, maintained or their drains being clean, but they are very concerned about national issues as well. And as a matter of fact, when you go to their house, right, you're not you're not there telling them, oh, they're doing this nationally because it affects because it affects them. They they end up telling you that this is what's happening nationally, and we don't want this, and we need we need we need this to change, and this is why and this is why we're going out to vote so 
and this does filter down to them it affects them at the end of the day so it's it's not like um it's transversing from national issues to your local issues they are part and parcel of this this whole entire thing like when it comes to taxes and stuff like that i think um i saw the other day that the government of guyana is revaluing every single house in the country and your your property so they know these people know that at the end of the day this will filter down to them this is another increase in taxes that they will have to pay and so you know it's not just it's and, and by doing that it's not just about the larger matters it's about them as well because those decisions that the central government makes will in fact be abhorrent to them and that is why the party is saying that we will not be supporting any raise in um, you know increase in taxes at the local government at the local government and the local authority area as well Ron, what message are you taking um, in your your house out what have Mr. you received from above and what are you taking Look, below? mr ram there's only one problem the problem as it relates to a human being is satisfying the basic necessities of life which is food shelter and clothing and our state of economy doesn't say that we're supplying the basic necessities of life what is being selling out there is a theory that states that wait on oil and we can live this miracle life yeah. right <laughs> so as a result of selling that, get the Guyanese people is in a remote position. Remote position. My question is, what are you doing? What What's the message you said? This is why I'm on the wheel, aggressively encouraging the people in my community to have a voice, to add value to how they should believe and what they should push me when I get into City Hall, right? To deliver for them so they can better their lives, whether infrastructurally, right, whether it's, it's, it's proper health care in the community, whether it's a social issue in terms of police, and just to backtrack a bit, the, the Albaistown Charleston area got a serious violent issue and lack of policing group. I'm, I'm not talking about police, policing group to, to harm, but mm -hmm. policing group to protect. to protect and control yes. because the we need control mechanisms in, 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 in that area. So there is, there is, just let me finish, there is a nexus. There is a nexus between the message it's selling up mm -hmm. top at Central and at the local level. But the information is being mispeddled. Let me put it that way. Gail, I'll bring you in now. What, what is the party at the end? Top echelon, you know, that, that very sacrosanct group of <laughs> sure about us. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the message that is sending out to these the three? You said 3,000 persons? 3,000 candidates. Wow. <coughs> yeah. Lot, yeah. Yeah, what is, backers, yeah. What is the message? It's about demanding going out there <coughs> and talking about. <coughs> Uh, good governance, transparency, accountability, citizen involvement. And that obviously with that is that only the PVPC can deliver that. Only the People's Progressive Party, our track record being in government and that even when... We you, you know you had, you had problems at some of those very scores. Yeah, they, 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 when I look at what's going on now, yes, there were accusations and there were perceptions and there were uh, s accusations, but... When I look at the level of corruption going on now in this government, whatever the PEP was or was not doing pales in significance, and that's not to excuse it. I'm just I, I was saying, about to say that. No, 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 I'm not excusing it. Doesn't defend anything, it at all. But I'm saying bring the facts. If the and and the facts have to be brought, what? But that doesn't mean that when we come to local government elections, the issue of empowering people to be more involved, we we have to recognize too that, and this is where I think APNU. Um, and AFC, you know, they, they have refused to see the linkage between local and national. So when you're asking about local and na national, Linden Town, for example, Bauxite was near collapse, remember? Mm -hmm. And so we could have said, local government, you have an IMC, let them run it, raise the taxes, people poor. What we did was get involved with looking for investors in Bauxite, looking for 
what you call the the different concessions to do with electricity and water and so on so on so on, to make sure that people weren't further impoverished what the government has done in many of the ndcs particularly those ndcs that we won we won 65 percent of the ndcs in 19 in 2016. what they've done is what amelia has talked about put us under heavy manners with money they and I, let me just give an example about but it. I, I did ask a example. specific question. No, 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 but I want what, to use it to... What do you say? You have to... What people have... Let, let's preamble a bit. The, you have an example like Bartika, classic example. APNU AFC controls central government. Region is controlled by APNU AFC. Township controlled by APNU AFC. So you have a classic, perfect model if you were in government, to say all the things should fall into place. You've got the guys at the top, the guys in the middle, the guys at the bottom, all in place. What have they done? They have squandered the good, good support that they got by 100 and, uh, 120 million being spent from central government. So when you talk about money, the 24 million uh, that's transferred to Georgetown, that isn't exactly the, the true amount because they gave 120 million to Bartica for what? The Bolivar, which one company, Ansa Macal, has the, the contract for. They're not allowed to now bring in their little vendors selling their little local beer or whatever because that competes with the brand of Ansa Macal, the brands of Ansa Macal. Two recreational parks, 40 million each, one they call Alligator Park. In the meantime, the roads are in disaster. The roads have deteriorated. More fees for the vendors. So what I'm saying is that here is a classic example of a government, central, regional, and local that have not paid attention. In the meantime, you have mining and forestry. No, but in, my in question trouble. is, my question is, what is the PPPC doing from the central level? What is the message it's saying? Is it saying, look, these are some national issues. You go and devise your local and your regional issues. Is that how you do it? I mean, as the, a matter of strategy. I'll, I'll say this, that in the, if you look at the handbills coming out of each of the local authority, there are some general demands that are across the board, all 80. Mm -hmm. As, as uh, our comrades here have said, transparency, accountability, inclusion. Because what is the classic legacy that the APNU AFC is leaving, not only the national level, but at the regional and, and local level is no consultation, no involvement. Mm -hmm. So you go and you say have a, a park meters, nobody knows about it. You go and build a, a boulevard, nobody knows about it until it happens. So that the, we have to say to people as our mantra is that, look, if this thing's going to work with local authority, you have to have a greater voice in it. You have to be included. Mm -hmm. We have to have, you cannot have this procurement and tendering going on by, by uh, violating the procurement laws. Mm -hmm. And the so these are basic, the basic things you're talking about. How can you improve the conditions of people in Alboystown um, and, and Charlestown? If the money that is supposed to be there to do drainage in the area is used for something else. Mm -hmm. And so these are local issues. The, the marriage or the nexus between national and local sometimes get fudged. And central government has a responsibility, I believe, that to help to help these bodies get uh, get better. Not to give money for Kitty Market, which has now been closed for three years, and 200 odd million dollars being spent. And money this is This is the, 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 the corruption, particularly in Georgetown City Council, is so astounding. It is so, I feel embarrassed as a Guyanese, a former Georgetown citizen, I'm not living in Georgetown now, but Someone, as a, as a person who grew up, I grew up in work in Ross area. I'm embarrassed that the city that I grew up in and known all my life has got into such, uh, what you call, um, obscene levels of, of, of corruption. Seriously. You, you said earlier that um, this election is also um, about 2020. And I know you weren't talking about oil. You are talking about no. general elections is the PPPC, and I'll, I'll put the same question if the a <coughs> APNU comes on the program, put the same question to the AFC as well. Is the PPPC using local government elections as a proxy 
for its national agenda and for 2020 elections? I don't think that the, the uh, I think all the political parties are, are worried about these elections. Probably local government elections without having uh, APNU AFC in government may have been, as you said, uh, lower turnout. With APNO AFC in government and what we've seen happen to the economy, what's happened to mining, forestry, bauxite, sugar, rice, VAT, cost of living, um, people, yes, this, these, I believe, these elections are about people expressing, whether you use the strong words you've used, but whether it's a reflection, a reflection of how people feel about or a referendum and a, yeah, yeah those are those are very strong very heavy political words i think the regular citizen is feeling many people are saying we're not going to vote because they broke our promises to us we went and voted up new afc and they they betrayed us other people are saying that we have to show them that they don't represent the people anymore they don't represent us anymore so in a sense yes it is about at these local elections in particular because it's proximity to 2020, I believe that there is the battle, uh, uh, the persuasion of the hearts and the minds as to really what's going on and what's happening to the country. So there are local issues that need to be addressed, absolutely. But there's also, a, a, the voter is not foolish. Sit in a taxi and talk to a taxi man. He knows the connection between when rice falling apart and sugar workers ain't getting job, that he's not getting people to take his taxi or he doesn't have business. So there is a local issue as Amelia will talk about, you know, garbage collection, for example. But there's also the issues that people feel that how do I improve my living, my life? If I don't, I have to pay too many taxes. So there is the nexus at these elections, probably more than 2016. And I believe there is a, a a mood in the country to say to APNU AFC, you know, you've had three years and we're not happy. Now, let me, let me put this question to, um, to, to George Chungus. Um, you've seen how the, the, the winner-take-all pattern of behavior has dominated the Council. city council. I'm not sure that that has not happened in PPP, C-dominated councils as well. How, do, how does the PPPC in these elections and moving forward assure voters that, look, we are using this not only as a proxy for 2020, but as a, as a, a benchmark for saying, from now things are different that the PPP has learned its lesson, it's been out of power, that it's now, it has, it's, it's changed its dynamics. How, how, how was there in it? Well, what the, can you tell voters about the, that? The People's Progressive Party and its organization for this local government election has made it very clear that, and has mandated for the councillors who will be elected to go into the council, they're there to effect the core services, whatever is required in those um, various areas. Uh, if you perform the services that are necessary for each of these uh, local authority areas, whether it's municipality or NDCs, uh, you're just doing your duty. This, cumulatively, all these NDCs and municipalities performing together will lead up to um, the national elections, which is not very long from now. As you know, next year, perhaps campaigning will start from, from that. But the point that you made there about winner takes all, if they're properly directed, they're properly guided as to what their responsibilities are to citizens, then it should not be a problem whether you have a majority of one. That's a theory. Two. Right. That's I'm talking about the practice. But the practice is uh, if I could, within the council of the time that I've been there, I've been trying um, from a conscientious standpoint to try to get things done for the benefit of the citizens because I see that as a responsibility. On the other hand, that has not been occurring on their side. Now, if we get back to that question you had raised before about um, major parties involved in local government elections, remember the major parties are composed of people that live in the communities, like in the local government commission, uh, at local government authority, the municipality. I live in Georgetown. When residents have a problem, they know who to go to, they know the street where I live, and they call me, and I've gone to many communities in that way. 
So whether you belong to a big party or you don't, I don't see it as being an impediment uh, to get into the um, local government elections. Um, leading up to 2020, I think um, we want an opportunity to show the citizens what we can do. George Sung has been managed for over 52 years since independence by essentially one group of people. And the bottom line is that they have not proven that they can manage the city. It has be been in one chaos, one scandal to another. There's over three billion, close to three billion in, in debt. The garbage contractors are owed about 150 million and they have stated, publicly stated, that they're about to withdraw their services for non-payment. There are a lot of contracts that have been issued there without public tendering. And um, there are excuses loophole in the Municipal and District Councils Act that are, allows them to bypass that because the minimum, the maximum they can spend without public tendering is 250000 and they have consistently used that. There are no audited financial statements. So all of these things over a period of time have proven that they are incapable of managing the city. And we are asking citizens to give us an opportunity, uh, give us a chance to go in there in the fifth, for the 15th constituency. Let us show you what can be done. The term of the office of the, anybody elected in the council is three years, and we want to show that we can bring changes to the city of Georgetown. We can manage the city of Georgetown, given the resources that are there in an accountable, transparent manner, and getting citizens' involvement, not making unilateral decisions. Gail will tell you, Ron um, and Amelia, that, that in, in days gone by, local government, village communities and so on, used to be the, the training ground mm. for national politics. Mm. Is that what we're saying? Uh, I, I, you and, and Amelia yeah. evolving into national this politicians? This is a new crop of leaders coming up. <coughs> well, well, well there is ambition in that in in that direction you know <laughs> right there is ambition in that direction um and we never know what the future holds right but um for now my community has concerns has major concerns and me i i'm as a, as a person that like i said before is a product of that environment would like to make well i i'm presently i'm making contributions it's just that it's not community known mm -hmm. right and uh, we've been plagued with many situations of teenage pregnancy, um, drugs, drugs, alcoholism, violence, everything, everything that is associated with not growing up and having a proper childhood or adolescenthood. And a lot has to do with poverty yes. and the kind of political system mm. this country has had since, what, 1989, this economic recovery program. And, we, well, we were talking about um, th this young crop of local government people um, and gravitating and migrating to a so, higher level. I think when getting involved in politics, you need to understand that which at whatever level you are, you have a part to play. You ser we serve the people. And if climbing the ladder means gives me greater influence, then I think that's something in the future to, you know... And you're sitting at the right hand of... Contemplate. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> but no. you know, for 28 years, when we didn't have democracy here, young leaders like myself then, and you who were around then, you're a little older than I am. Uh, much um, older. Much older, yes. <laughs> that there was no local government elections. Yeah. There was no local government elections. You didn't have them at all um, in the 70s and 80s. And then Parliament, you had rigged elections, so the PVP had six seats in Parliament. And then later on, I think the WPA got one. So for the leaders that were in my age group, in our 20s, there was nothing until 1992, yeah. when some became ministers, some became MPs. So this, this but, but, local but the, government the, the is, a, is the, an important the, the training Dogil ground those, for the next crop yes, of leaders in, for our country. It. And I see that. I look at these young people coming on and not only young people, not everyone has to be young, but people who have a, a capacity to lead, a capacity to lead, a capacity to serve and give. And this is what will uh, energize and, uh, and, and to keep the PPP a C as a vibrant, relevant party. And that's what our relevance amongst the people. All right. Relevant. I'm told we've got six minutes more. <laughs> and I, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a, Speak to the voters. Who wants to start? Speak to the voters, local government elections. You want people to vote for you, for you and your party, and, and your, your local people. Who will start? No, I think that the, that the, that the younger people, and I'll come yes, in at the tail end familiar. if necessary. 
<laughs> well, uh, first you're speaking of all, to the voters. You're yeah, speaking first to the voters. Why they should vote for us? Um, <laughs> local government is not about the major parties and getting their agenda over. It's about you, the people, and making sure that making sure that your needs and your community develop. Uh, in the sh whether in the three year that we're there or in the long run, so in order for you to, you know, have a say, you need to come out and vote, and you need to vote for the PPPC. Um, we are, we are assuring that there will be greater accountability. Um, we are a party that holds our councillor responsible for the things they do within their constituency and within their NDC. Is there any kind of code of conduct? I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but is there a code of conduct? There clear, is, clear. Uh, once people are elected, oh, oh, there oh. is a, a code, okay. uh, uh, something they have to yeah. abide by, yeah. Oh, yeah, Ms. Once elected. So, and I know that there are a lot of people that are not motivated to come out and vote, but I'm saying to you, you have a right to vote, um, you have a right to determine what happens within your community, and the only way you can assure that things go right is by coming out and vote. So I would like to encourage everybody to come out and vote. And yeah, that. Who's going next? I'm going next. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to, um, to the voters, my name is Ron. <coughs> I'm from Constituency 10, or by St. Charlestown. And just to let you know, just to let you know that um, I'm a product of that environment, and I was able to achieve success out of that community. I was able to acquire a tertiary level education. Um, I'm, I'm married, I've been married for over a decade, mind you. <laughs> and because it's not prevalent in, in those kind of yes. societies, right? So, I mean, I mean, if I was born in, in probably Pushad Nagar, or, or that, that would have been the regular trend, but coming out of where I come from is an achievement. <laughs> and I, I'm using myself as a pillow to let you, to let you the people of our Bystown Charles, to know and believe that there is hope, that, that there is hope in me representing your concerns in those communities. Thank you. Um, my name is Bishram Kupen. Um, in my early years, I was a, an officer in the Guyana Defense Force. I live in Rob Street. Um, um, and I'm really interested in seeing improvement in my community. I'd looked for years. Um, the neighborhood was going down the drain. I consulted the members within the community. At some point, we were talking about what could be improved, and then I was encouraged encouraged to um, com contest for local government elections. Um, I contested local government elections in 2016 and I joined the council. I had great hopes and ambition for improvements in the community, but because of the, the state of the council, the way they were thinking, uh, they did not go ahead with many of the recommendations that were being made. Uh, we know that they have been there for over 52 years. Um, I think it's time for a change. Currently, the Commission of Inquiry has really validated many of the concerns that I'd raised over the years. I want to see a council that uh, completes its core services, meaning drainage, uh, street lights, etc. And um, I'm hoping that our team from the People's Progressive Party, Civic, will be given a chance, an opportunity to show the citizens what we can do with the same resources that they have. Um, so I will ask that you vote for us, uh, give us an opportunity to serve you in the Georgetown City Council. Gail, you have the last, <laughs> last 75 seconds. <laughs> well, the, as I've said before, the People's Progressive Party Civic is, um, has 3,000 contestants, candidates, uh, throughout the 80 local authorities, and these are backed by 27,000 uh, backers. 27,000? Uh, yeah, excluding, excluding the ones that are fraudulent that we have before the court now in Region 3 and 6, as well as others waiting on GCOM to deal with. But we, we, we are coming to the people in 80, 80 local authorities to say that the previous Progressive Party has had a track record, track record in government, and that we are able to offer a new culture, uh, a better culture of governance at the local authority level. We recognize that APNU AFC remaining in government put some strain on what we can do and that is why we've been cautious in making promises because after the 2016 elections we learned that resources were not easily available even those that were uh, what the local authority bodies were entitled to. A vote for the PPC is a vote for change, 
and not change, as we've said, and not fit and proper like AFC is talking about. So they will come to talk about fit and proper. I don't know what fit and proper means when you're talking about local authority or local government or people's participation. Fit and proper, I thought, was when you're selecting a candidate or a GCOM chairman. So um, they, I'm not quite sure what APNU's Please write them. slogan is. Hmm? Please write them. Yes, I know. So <laughs> the <coughs> PPPC is clear. We're coming with straight involvement, inclusion, transparency, accountability and that we are capable of being able to manage the communities better. However, until we're able to win government in 2020, which we will, that we will be unable to give the kind of financial support that many of these local authorities need. Thank you, Mr. Shearer. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's fine. Uh, I, was, I paused for a breath. <laughs> Gail, uh, Ms. Emilia Ali, Mr. Bishram Kapen, and Mr. Raul Namus, thank you so much for appearing on Play Talk to advance the PPPC's case for support from the voters in the local government elections. As I will say to every other political group that comes on this program, best wishes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. You. May, may you live up to the very commitments you've made this evening. Yep. Operators thank and viewers, thank you and good night. See you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.